Cloistered within the Sistine Chapel, cut off from the outside world, the Cardinals deliberate, campaign, pray, and vote. The Conclave's isolation will not end until one of the Cardinals has been elected Pope, no matter how long it takes. Throughout the history of electing popes, there have been all different lengths of time to elect popes. It's been as many as weeks and months, or as short as a few days. Some cardinals who've come down from the north, very cold weather, and they come to Rome and find beautiful sunny weather. And I'm sure for them it must have been difficult to go back to the northern cold. So I think that maybe in the years past, some of the elections carried on a little bit longer. And I think that they encouraged them to get the votes quickly by sometimes actually closing them in the Sistine Chapel and sealing it with wax and expecting a vote before they were allowed to come back out. Outside in St. Peter's Square, a crowd begins to gather. They wait, they speculate, they pray. But above all, they watch for a telltale plume of smoke rising from the chapel. Each time a vote is taken, the ballots are counted, then burned. If no candidate wins a two-thirds majority, special chemicals are added to the ballots to produce black smoke. But outside, what people are waiting for is a plume of white smoke. The pilgrims and the crowd will wait here in the square and look to see if the smoke comes up white or black. If the smoke is black, it means they have to re-vote. If the smoke is white, it means a new post has been elected. The smoke signals last rose in October of 1978. Seven times the smoke was black. Finally, after eight ballots, white smoke rose from the chapel, and a cheer rose from the square. The cheer was mixed with astonishment. This conclave of cardinals had elected a pope who was different, dramatically different. The first thing about this pope that you have to know is he's Polish, and, and his Polishness defines him. First of all, he's the first non-Italian pope in more than 400 years. Also, his Polishness defines him because of his experience in World War II. He is the first pope to be a worker. He worked under the Nazi occupation as a common laborer. He used a pickaxe uh, to break up rocks during World War II. So he has a unique background for a pope, this first Polish pope. Every pope in the Vatican leaves his personal mark, sets his own agenda. Pope John Paul II's agenda quickly proved a grueling one up at 5.30 each morning. An unending series of spiritual and ceremonial duties to perform. A steady stream of visiting dignitaries to welcome. Some religious, others political. And always throngs of people to greet and to bless. Finally at 11.30, bedtime. Six hours before starting all over again. After more than 20 years in office, John Paul II has reigned three times as long as an average pope. In recent years, his pace has slowed, yet he still radiates a powerful charisma. The people who flock to see him still feel that charisma and help to re-energize it. He can go out and be very, very tired. Just, we've seen him, we've all seen him bent over, and looking very preoccupied maybe with the state of his health. And yet when he gets out and makes contact with the people, there is a rejuvenation. There seems to be an energy flow that comes into him from the people. And he brightens. By the end of a mass, you can see that he is stronger, that he's sharper. And he starts to joke with the people. And there's a response back and forth. John. John Paul II, he wants you. For the Pope, the Vatican is home and office, sanctuary and stage. Being Pope means playing a powerful spiritual and ceremonial role. 
And in the media-driven 20th century, playing that role often means playing to the camera. For Pope John Paul II, it comes naturally, by temperament and by training. Going to his secular background, he thought he was going to become an actor. And he is a great actor as Pope, as we have seen. He has a uh, capacity for the dramatic uh, that is absolutely uh, astonishing to watch. His hold on people is, is not totally spiritual. It's also dramatic. For an institution rooted in 2,000 years of tradition, the Vatican has shown a remarkably shrewd grasp of modern media and communications. 70 years ago, Vatican Radio went on the air with a transmitter designed by Guglielmo Marconi, radio's inventor. Today, Vatican Radio broadcasts throughout the world in 32 languages. Vatican Television also broadcasts worldwide. But the power of the Pope's words pales beside the power of the Pope's presence. In the Vatican's arsenal of communications weaponry, the biggest gun of all is the papal visit, the Vatican road trip. This Pope attracts larger crowds than any politician, any U.S. president, any rock star, any opera star, any entertainer, anyone in the world. He brings a message of hope, which is the central idea of the Christian faith. In 1933, Franklin Roosevelt said, we have nothing to fear but fear itself. In the 1970s, the 1980s, and the 1990s, John Paul II has been saying, be not afraid. But if the Pope brings hope and courage to the faithful, he can also bring trouble to the mighty, to the rulers and politicians of the world. For all its history and tradition, the Vatican, as a nation, is a 20th century creation. The 1929 treaty with Italy, signed by dictator Benito Mussolini, officially recognized the Vatican's independence and sovereignty. It is a nation in miniature. Its border can be circumnavigated on foot in less than an hour. Its antiquated army today numbers just 110. Yet the Vatican has one of the world's most sophisticated diplomatic corps and maintains relations with more countries than the United States. As heads of state, the popes of the 20th century acquired new political power. Perhaps no one has wielded that power more forcefully than Pope John Paul II. He is an enormously powerful man, and he has used his power. He has used his power geopolitically, and he's used his power spiritually. And, and what makes him different than any other modern pope is his spiritual power combined with geopolitical ingenuity. In June of 1979, John Paul II, less than one year into his reign as pope, waded into a fierce power struggle in his native country, Poland. For decades, Polish Catholics had chafed beneath the atheistic boot of Soviet-style communism. But all that was about to change. On June 2nd, the Pope arrived in Poland. On that date, a new chapter in history began for Poland and for the Vatican. The first realization of just how powerful this Pope was for the Soviets came during the Pope's first visit to Poland. Soviets did not want him to go, but the Polish authorities said, we can't keep a Polish Pope from coming to Poland. And during that visit, more than two thirds of the people of Poland turned out to see their Pope, Karol Wojtyla. 
But the really great moment came the first day. He addressed a crowd of about a quarter of a million people in the great central square in Warsaw, and he declared that excluding Christ from any longitude or any latitude is a sin against man, not against God. From that moment on, uh, the Soviets knew that this pope was a great threat to them in Poland. The powerful drama of the Pope's visit unfolded on worldwide television. In America, one viewer was a Republican presidential candidate, Ronald Reagan. Watching with him was Richard Allen, who would become Reagan's national security advisor. And Reagan, with tears in his eyes, turned Allen after watching the Pope with this declaration and said, there is now a metastasis in the body of communism, and it's this pope. Events in Poland moved swiftly after the pope's visit. Polish labor unions took up the cry for reform, and a wave of labor strikes spread across Poland in 1980. The hunger for freedom was growing stronger. In Moscow, nerve center of the communist empire, Officials watched and worried. Kremlin leaders were determined not to lose their grip on Poland. The Soviets had never faced a situation such as they, they did in Poland, which is to say a workers' movement, solidarity, an anti-communist workers' movement behind the Iron Curtain, protected uh, and to a certain extent instigated uh, by this Polish pope. And the result was constant buildup of Soviet troops on the other side of the Polish border and the threat of invasion, and the world held its breath. But in Washington, the White House was watching Poland too, watching and cheering. During his final months as president, Jimmy Carter embraced the cause of Poland and joined forces with the Vatican. Carter's national security advisor was also a Pole, a big name of Brzezinski. Brzezinski called the Pope, and speaking in Polish, he asked the Pope to contact the Catholic leaders of Western Europe and to get them to urge the Soviets not to invade uh, and to say to the Soviets that they would cut off trade and cultural relations and isolate the Soviet Union if the Soviets went ahead and invaded. I, Ronald Reagan, do solemnly swear that I... With the inauguration of Ronald Reagan as president, the Vatican's ties to the White House became even stronger. For the first time in history, the United States appointed an ambassador to the Vatican. But the connections went beyond official diplomatic channels. A backdoor channel was opened, too. Top Reagan officials made secret visits to the Vatican briefing the Pope on Soviet troop movements, relaying intelligence reports, even sharing spy satellite photos. One regular visitor was CIA Director William Casey. Well, the Reagan administration formed a remarkably close uh, relationship uh, with the Vatican, uh, almost uh, a kind of wholly anti-communist alliance. William Casey, Reagan's CIA director was a devout Catholic, uh, and he undertook about a half dozen secret visits to meet with the Pope. Information was uh, exchanged, uh, and at crucial points, uh, the Pope said to Casey that the United States had to be very careful not to be too belligerent, because above all else, the Pope wanted this workers' movement to remain nonviolent. The Holy Alliance prevailed. Opposed by the Polish people, the White House, and the Vatican, the Kremlin backed down. Soviet troops finally dispersed. Poland took a giant step toward democracy, and the rest of Eastern Europe soon followed. But the Pope's high profile and political activism almost ended less than two years after they began. In May of 1981, as John Paul II worked a crowd in St. Peter's Square, a Turkish gunman put two bullets in the Pope.
the shots were fired at close range with deadly accuracy. It was the worst act of violence at the Vatican since the sack of Rome back in 1527. After his recovery, Pope John Paul II resumed his quest to re-establish the Vatican as a formidable player on the world stage. The goal, not military might or territorial gain, but human rights and religious freedom. He's really tried to make that the hallmark of the Catholic Church. Uh, he's gone all over the world, the traveling pope, talking and preaching human rights and democracy. It has been absolutely remarkable in the trips that the pope has taken. Uh, the areas of the world into which he's ventured, showing that, that there can be freedom, there can be opportunity, there can be the recognition of the dignity of the human being. In the battle for human rights, the Vatican's warriors are no longer freelance mercenaries as in centuries past, but ordinary Catholics armed only with rosary and crucifix. nearly one billion Christian soldiers. One recent battleground, Cuba, ruled by Fidel Castro. Castro's communist regime had long repressed religion, but gradually even Castro softened his stance. And in 1998, John Paul II became the first pope to set foot in Cuba. The trip was a combination of shrewd Vatican politics and classic papal charisma. The Pope, uh, while he may not have uh, received a letter of resignation from Fidel Castro, certainly went in with some conditions about loosening the hold on the Catholic Church in Cuba, allowing them to more openly uh, practice the faith. In fact, when Castro realized how the wind was blowing down there, uh, not only did they stop threatening churchgoers, saying that, well, you're going to lose your job if you go to see the Pope when he's here, he gave him the day off. With its reclaimed political power, the modern Vatican can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the rulers of the world. But the Vatican now faces one of the greatest challenges to its power ever. A fierce battle between liberals and conservatives for the heart and soul of the Catholic Church. Today, nearly 2,000 years into the life of the Vatican, the Church enjoys greater prestige and greater power than it has in centuries. But that power is being challenged, and from a surprising direction, from within the Catholic Church itself liberal Catholic dissidents. Many of the dissidents are Americans. American Catholics, some 60 million strong, are increasingly divided between those who follow the Vatican's teachings on social, moral, and sexual issues and those who dismiss them as outdated and irrelevant. I've often felt that the Vatican is, is almost totally out of step with everything that the American Catholic believes and values in terms of their own personal life. Um, this is a Vatican that has uh, rejected divorced and remarried Catholics and said they cannot receive the sacraments, that um, is opposed to married male priests, that says we cannot even talk about whether or not women could or should be priests, that rejects responsible parenthood in the form of the use of contraception. Strong-willed American Catholics have forced the Vatican to walk a dizzying tightrope. It dare not alienate some of its most educated and affluent constituents, but it cannot ignore their disobedience. This is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. This Pope believes that the last 300 years of Western thought has been antithetical to Christianity uh, and to Christian morality. He has a very ambiguous view of the United States. He loves a lot about the United States, and at the same time, he thinks to, that, that we are morally lax, to say the least. As he supposedly has often said, uh, America is so influential 
that what happens in America uh, in one year uh, happens every place else 10 years later. So if there's a focus on North America, and I think there is, uh, that's part of the reason for it. For the present, at least, the battle lines appear drawn. The divisions appear deep. In the tug of war between a conservative Vatican and a liberal America, the outcome is far from certain. But one thing seems sure. Whatever the changes, the Vatican will survive. For two millennia now, the Vatican has weathered storm after storm. It's been sacked by emperors, poisoned by greed and ambition, abandoned for greener pastures. And it has risen time and time again like a phoenix from the ashes. The past 1,000 years have brought sweeping changes to the Vatican, to its outside at least. But the Vatican's inside, the faith on which it stands, has remained remarkably constant. The altar may stand beneath a newer roof, but it still stands, spiritually and physically, on the bones of St. Peter. That much has held true for nearly 2,000 years and promises to hold true for another 1,000. A 1,000 years, wrote Peter, are but a day in the eyes of God. By that reckoning, by the reckoning of eternity, Peter himself arrived in Rome yesterday at dawn.